Hi, everyone. My name is Joey Cartagini. I'm the health center manager for the Homeless Persons Health Project, which is a clinic in the county of Santa Cruz. This is just our disclosure. I'm doing this presentation with uh, Chris Prasad. From the, he's a treatment center director with BART programs. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Prasad. I'm the program director at BART programs on Market Street. We are in the Tenderloin district of, this, of San Francisco. Um, and what I hope to do for you folks today is to convey um, strategies and ways for existing programs to find ways to help patients complete treatment. Um, a lot of times we're always talking about ways to attract folks or we're talking about finding ways to um, new innovative ways for outreach. Um, but I think there's a missed opportunity here where we can look at the existing population that we're working with and keep them in, help them not only stay in treatment, but to get to that last part, which is complete treatment. Um, one of our goals at BART programs is to serve as many patients as safely as possible. Um, and our goal is also to treat all opiate seeking patients, um, patients who are seeking opiate treatment, um, the, the services that, that they need on a daily basis. Um, a question that comes up in just in just a show of hands, um, how many of you in the room have actually been inside a narcotic treatment program or an opiate treatment program? Okay, that's pretty good. A lot more than I was expecting. So we saw a lot of maps today. We saw a lot of graphs that indicate the state of California's overdose deaths. And um, here are some figures here, but what I really wanted to know is, uh, or convey is that in, in many people do consider two, if not uh, three cities, the highest um, and, and most severe epicenters of the opioid crisis. And that is um, Los Angeles, San Diego, um, and San Francisco. Sacramento absolutely has its, um, just driving around the city the last couple of days, you can definitely see there is a lot of need here as well. Um, San Francisco, I can speak to specifically, they have, uh, or we have the, one of the largest open air drug markets in the nation. Um, there is rampant drug selling, uh, using, there is um, a very large population of drug dealers um, day and night. And um, the issue is that the fentanyl is extremely cheap. It's extremely av available, it's abundant, and it's almost mixed in almost any substance that you're looking into, as we've heard many times today. The, um, one of the reasons why our program was selected to expand our hours is because we are centrally located and we have a lot of patients that are already coming to us. And so the thought process was is that if this program is able to expand their hours, maybe they can cast a broader net and, and circumvent those patients and funnel all doors to Bart Market Street. Um, and that would alleviate the, the overutilization that we're seeing at the emergency departments at um, or the uh, also uh, caused uh, the, the caused onto the emergency uh, response teams, PD, fire, EMS, all of these departments are having um, shortages and they're having an, an abundance of um, response times to their programs. I'm sorry, to to um, our programs. In uh, 2020, there was roughly 100 more deaths overdose deaths than there were in, uh, than there were caused by COVID-19. And um, throughout that crisis, many of your programs were probably still open and needed to stay open primarily because you were considered a vital and um, uh, important resource to the community. And by closing your doors, you would be adding to the problem at the emergency departments. Um, and that was, that was pretty much our case as well. Um, in December of last year, um, basically January through March of this year, the mayor for San Francisco declared a public health emergency because of the number of deaths and the sheer structural violence that was happening in the Tenderloin specifically. 
Um, and in that three month period, uh, several resources were created, several new strategies and task, force, task forces were initiated. Um, some of the funding that was generated for that cause um, is as a result of why we're now open and we're planning to have a program go 24 seven. Um, there are five other opiate treatment programs in the city. And although on a lot of the maps that we saw today, San Francisco didn't really pop out, but um, it is a very dense um, and, and very um, high volume traffic uh, pro city and county. Um, it, sometimes it does feel like our program is the only program open at certain days, at certain times of the day, uh, just by the sheer volume of patients coming, our, coming through our door. So um, here is sort of the operating hours and the plan for our program to um, roll on to a 24 seven um, treatment center. Our current shift uh, or our, our main shift, our core shift is from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, that shift has been in existence for decades. And that's um, in a large part what the national standard is for most opiate treatment programs, five to one, six to two, if not, maybe a little bit later. Um, but a lot of question and a lot of concern comes up. What happens after everyone closes? What happens to um, all of the opiate treatment programs in a county or in a city that uh, close their doors after a certain time? Um, and so our first plan was to open up um, gradually and not just open up all shifts because that uh, has proven to be chaotic. Um, so our first shift was to open uh, from 2.30 to 10 p.m. And that started back in April. As of April 1st um, till now, we have uh, successfully been able to not only secure staff, um, which sounds like a you know, very basic need, but I mean, it can be a lot more challenging finding people, providers, dedicated, compassionate folks to work in a very high traffic, dangerous sometimes part of the city. Um, so securing staff is vital um, and just by having that secured staff, um, I would consider this first phase a success. Our second step is going to be to open up our Saturdays and Sundays, our weekend shift, to um, not only just dosing, but to also providing admissions. So again, securing more staff and securing the vital um, medical staff members to be able to do assessments, to do dose assessments, to um, do inductions and whatever might be needed to enroll patients. Um, and again, industry standard, there are a lot of programs that are not open Saturdays and Sundays. So um, most programs will be able to just provide uh, face doses if needed. And if there's anything else needed, like for example, a dose increase, um, that person would most likely have to wait till Monday. Waiting till Monday could be, a lot of things can happen as you know. Um, so that is phase two. Um, and um, after that, we hope to then open up our doors from 10.30 p.m. to 6 a.m., which would kind of catch all of our patients um, and be just sort of a catch-all to the city and to the county and make sure that um, we don't leave anyone behind. Um, if EMS or some of these street crisis response teams that are in the city, if they pick someone up, instead of going to the ER where someone may be misdiagnosed or someone may be caught and released, um, and, um, uh, you know, someone might not catch or recognize the withdrawal symptoms, that person could easily be, again, misdiagnosed, as opposed to coming to our doors, having EMS or having some of these response teams bring that person to our doors. And that's actively happening through our um, second shift in, in the evening. And we want it to happen at the most critical hours of the night, which are the 10 to 6 a.m., so it is still a work in progress, and our goal is to have um, pretty much all of these bars green, where green would indicate that that's a fully staffed and operating shift to allow um, a patient to receive intake. So this report just shows in the last six months what's been going on in our program in terms of uh, admissions. So what we're seeing is that in the last six months, there is an upward trend of patients coming in for intake. Um, these, uh, this, this number is indicative of interest, of uh, people starting treatment, um, lives saved, whereas normally num someone would either in a withdrawal state use. Um, so we're happy to see this upward trend. Um, I, didn't get the, I didn't get to 
put the August numbers in there, it would look a little bit uh, um, higher there. But uh, as of August, we had 61 admissions to our program, and that is across all of our open shifts. Um, and in terms of services that we provide, we do intake admission, we do daily observed treatment, um, we do dose assessments, uh, individual counseling, um, treatment plans, urine drug screen interpretations, um, EKGs, et cetera. Um, and these are all services that we're hoping to continue throughout the entire shift. This is just a quick snapshot of what happens um, on, an, on an average night. Uh, this just looks at August 8th through um, August 12th. And each one of those days um, in the evening alone from 2 to 10 p.m., we're seeing a gradual rise in the number of patients coming in to achieve their or to, to receive their dose. Um, what that does is it increases the adherence for someone um, staying in treatment, whereas normally that person would be limited to coming in from 6 to 2. Now they have the ability to come in after 2, up until 10 p.m to get their dose. Um, a lot of times just meeting the sheer time frame of a, of a shift or of a program can be a challenge in itself. So now instead of um, John Doe having to rush to the clinic in the morning so that he can get his dose and then go take his family or his kids to school, now he can do all of that and still come in and dose before um, all of his responsibilities are done and um, you know, have, have time to do that. So um, a lot of patients have really um, liked that we're open a little bit later. There are a little bit, there are some um, downsides to, you know, some of our nature, the nature of some of our patients having, uh, avoiding some of the requirements. So there are, of course, requirements that we have in our program um, that we have to always look at and make sure that if someone is avoiding their obligations to our program um, and, and not being in a, uh, in a good patient standing, we have to look at what is the best time? Is there, is there a better structure for that person? But for now, we are really happy that we're operating in a capacity to open our doors um, for roughly 16 hours a day um, and allow patients to come in and get their dose. Um, in the month of July, we served just in the evening alone, uh, a little over 1800 patients. And what that means is that we're doing intakes, we're doing, um, we're providing people their dose, whereas normally they wouldn't have been able to. Um, so we're really proud of this figure and um, hoping that this number continues to rise. So um, back in, I would say July of this year, there was um, an article that came out for San Francisco methadone providers turning patients away. And um, the article really honed in on our program on Market Street. And in fact, uh, took some pictures of our front door and it really was supposed to be um, uh, highlighting how patients are being turned away from methadone programs when instead it didn't really capture the full story. And for anyone who um, plans on perhaps opening up extended hours, um, there are, I think, um, some ways that you can learn from my our lessons is that, um, you know, just being aware of the fact that um, educating your, your, your environment and some of your referents, letting them know that what it takes to come into our program, what is the medical criteria, what type of person um, would be most suitable to our scope of care. Um, and so one of London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, one of her initiatives was to open up the Tenderloin Linkage Center where anyone who would come into that program um, would be then referred to treatment or other resources that they might need. And uh, for the first several weeks, we had <clears throat> maybe um, a little over four or five patients a day being referred to us that were in stimulant withdrawal and on opiate withdrawal. And so that lack of education, that little bit of information wasn't clear to the staff that was redirecting patients uh, or potential patients. And um, we would think about, okay, we have someone waiting in our lobby for about 30 minutes in withdrawal, severe withdrawal at times. This is a disservice to that person. Why don't we educate the public on who exactly comes to us? So if that can be useful to you, I hope that um, that would help redirect patients in an appropriate time frame to where they need to go to. Um, 
And so uh, again, you know, not, not every patient would be able to meet our criteria of care. Um, and, um, you know, some of these occurrences can be um, if a patient walks in just with not enough time, if someone walks in just a few minutes left on the clock before we close our door, it doesn't give us the ability to complete intake for that individual. Um, when someone presents who is clearly um, too, too high, um, unable to even consent to care um, or even fill out paperwork, I mean, that's an indication that someone is just not ready. And um, we also you know, have different legal criteria as well. We wanna make sure we're always aware of. Um, how many of you heard that some of your patients might be being poached um, or being, uh, being appro approached by drug dealers before they come into clinic, before or after? Get a show of hands. Okay. Um, again, I thought that was gonna be a lot higher. <laughs> um, I uh, hear it every single day that uh, there, are, there are some of our patients walking into clinic are being targeted by drug dealers. Um, they want their customers back. And so this is um, a reality that we're faced with for most programs. Another way of increasing MAT in your programs might be to look at retention. Um, look at and really diagnose your retention efforts. Who is leaving your program? Um, as again, I mentioned earlier about, you know, trying to focus on the folks who are already in your program. Why not look into ways of um, keeping folks and retain retaining individuals? Have a sit down conversation with them. What works for you? What doesn't work for you? Um, the most frequent complaint that we see is that individuals feel like their dose or the medication just is not making an improvement fast enough. Um, that's something that I feel should be communicated to the medical team, um, should be communicated to other folks inside of the program um, to help increase uh, and achieve a therapeutic dose. Um, other ways are to make sure that there's an effective relationship with the counselor. Um, what, how long has someone been in treatment? Um, what does the UD what does the urine drug screen story tell us? Is there a high methamphetamine use inside of the last, say, 30 patients who completed admissions? If so, what does that mean? So looking at those things can, I think, help individuals or programs um, retain patients. Um, we talked about educating reference. Um, I think that's really important um, and helping, um, helping some of your friends know that they're they are doing a great job referring the correct population to us. So calling back to your emergency department or calling back to some of the community-based organizations by saying, hey, John Doe came in, he's completed treatment, just wanted to thank you for sending him over. He's doing great. He's been, um, he's been on treatment for the past five days. Um, if there's anyone else that you know of, let us know. Um, that I think invokes a little bit of confidence in some of your reference. Um, also, uh, we talked about retention earlier, but I think knowing your retention rate is also extremely important. Knowing how many patients stay in your program and how long they're staying in program. Is someone leaving within seven days of treatment? If so, why? Is someone leaving after 90 days of treatment? If so, um, that's really unusual, why? Um, so, I mean, unless they've completed treatment, that's a different story. Um, another way of increasing that in your programs might be to uh, to make your clinic have that home clinic vibe. Um, make sure that you look at your clinic through the lens of your patients. Um, make sure that you're possibly walking around your lobby and seeing what your patients see, listening to what they're listening to while they're completing um, their intake documentation. So I'm not sure how long some of your intake packets might be. Ours is um, a couple pages too long, but nonetheless, they're required forms, right? So um, filling out that paperwork in a state where you're already uncomfortable, a little bit of anxiety going on, and you are trying to get your dose and leave, um, while dogs are barking, while patients are fighting, or while things are going on, other distractors are happening. So think about that person who's filling out the forms. Think about what's going on through their uh, lens and possibly offering them a quieter space to fill out the paperwork. Um, I always think about this story when I was literally at my front desk and I watched someone throw the paperwork down and leave. And I followed her out and I asked her, what's going on? She said, I just can't. 
it's just too loud in that lobby for me to fill out the paperwork. I just can't focus. And I offered her a quiet exam room to fill out the paperwork. And luckily, we were able to get her back. But it's just some of those learning lessons that really make you uh, think twice. All right. Um, I think um, I wanted to just quickly touch base on managing the intake flow. This slide really quickly, just if, if you do have um, a uh, number of uh, patients coming in at one time and you have limited staff, this might be something that you encounter um, while opening up extended hours and opening up uh, different shifts um, is, is think about having backups. Think about having um, a backup for your dispensing department or perhaps your medical providers. Um, think of ways that you can expedite the documentation portion. Um, can things be truncated? If so, within compliance, um, you know, have those discussions with your compliance officers within your organization to say, We're, we had seven patients walk into our program. I don't want any one of those seven to leave just because we could not have, we didn't have the capacity to treat them. So what can we do to keep them in treatment and get them what they need? Uh, because if the, once they leave that, our door, we don't know what's going to happen. So having those type of conversations with perhaps your compliance team or um, you know, even um, those might, who might be responsible for making those decisions, I think would be vital to making sure you're as effective as possible. For us, our intake por portion that takes the longest would be the counseling portion. Um, there are several city, county, and, and, and state department um, uh, forms that are always necessary. So um, we're always inundated with that documentation. Just wrapping up here, um, I think I went over our intake and admission. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but when it comes to evening operations, I think the most important piece is just looking at ways where you can help who's in front of you without them leaving and feeling like the process is taking too long. Um, that's all I have for today. My name's Joey Cartagini. I'm the health center manager for the Homeless Persons Health Project, part of the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. Unlike Chris's program, we are not a narcotics treatment program. We're a federally qualified health center uh, with a MAP program. And we're pretty small. We only have three exam rooms. Um, we have a pretty robust staff that does a lot of different things, included integrated behavioral health. We have acupuncture, we have um, housing programs, we have a recuperative care center, uh, benefits advocacy, um, uh, sort of you name it, it's sort of uh, a little package deal over here in Santa Cruz. Our MAP program started back in, I'd say 2016, and, and since then uh, it has really grown. Um, to include several case managers, uh, many providers. I think we went from like two providers to something like 23 providers now um, who are now providing medication-assisted treatment. Um, and, and the reality is that, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about street medicine and uh, to be used as a strategy um, for harm reduction and for medication-assisted treatment, uh, sort of like within that context. The reality is we, we had to do street medicine I and mean, we were going to do it anyways because we wanted to, but uh, we had to see, you know, back when the pandemic happened, you know, all these places closed down and people were like, how, how are we going to do our support groups? We're like, well, let's, let's bring it to them. Plus we only have three exam rooms anyway. So you can only just do so many appointments in a clinic that small. So we literally just had to get more people out in the street. And um, so, you know, we, I had been asking for a mobile clinic for, for years uh, at the county. And so we were finally able to get that. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't ask for like a big old 40 footer because nobody could drive that probably. I wanted something that we could drive on the, on the, the levee in Watsonville or drive on the levee in Santa Cruz or, you know, go over, go over speed bumps or, you know, the occasional curb. Uh, I want to be able to park it in Trader Joe's, you know, so um, we can do all that with a 23 footer and still see some patients in there. Um, I, I have this up here because it has some of the numbers. Uh, really, you, we can see that in Santa Cruz County, we have 2,300 
people experiencing homelessness. This is slightly up from 2019. Uh, but this is a little off because uh, it doesn't take into account the uh, almost like a thousand people who had been housed, which is pretty amazing. A thousand people housed since the pandemic, uh, as well as unfortunately, uh, prior about the, the 150 people who have passed away since 2019, I believe. Um, so it doesn't take those numbers into account. So when you look at it that way, you you really do see an increase in homelessness. And then uh, coming down to this fourth bullet point on the shelter and transitional housing capacity, is like most of uh, all you uh, at the at the conference, you know, we had the project room key and we got a lot of our folks into motels, but then that sort of dried up, uh, at least in Santa Cruz County back in uh, April. And once those motels started closing up, even though people were connected with case managers, a lot of people were back on the street. Um, and... You know, uh, this is all self-reported, but I thought that it was interesting to see that chronically homeless indiv individuals uh, increased from about 403 to 921, and that there was some self-reported increase in behavioral health and substance use disorder among people experiencing homelessness. Um, it might not be a surprise, uh, and I, I, I like to try and think of the positive with that. So, like, what does this mean exactly? We do know that nationally there's been increases, but maybe also that somehow there's been some sort of a decrease in stigma. So more people are willing to talk about their substance use disorders. I'm trying to look at it like that, but we, we really don't know, uh, right? So uh, what we do know is that homelessness is a public health issue, and I'm not gonna go into all the details and go through all the, the stats, but we know that people experiencing homelessness face disproportionate health conditions, uh, more so than the average population. And uh, we unfortunately see that more than ever here in Santa Cruz County, where if you're homeless, you're, you're basically five and a half times more likely to die than somebody who's housed. Um, and just and this is actually 2021 annual report. This is not 2020. But we had a 33 percent increase in number of uh, individuals experiencing homelessness who passed away last year from the year prior to that. Um, so very unfortunate, very challenging and frustrating um, statistics. Uh, and we, we have this annual homeless memorial every year to, to honor the people that have passed. Um, we're fortunate at our clinic to actually manage some HUD funded housing programs. And uh, that's something that we, we, it's housing first, which is like the equivalent of harm reduction for housing programs. You, uh, just get people in there, no judgment. You try and connect them with services, and um, and usually you have pretty great outcomes. Um, for example, this is this is sort of an extreme case because this was was uh, very good outcomes. But we had uh, one of our patients who was just frequently hitting the ER, ambulance runs, inpatient stays. You can see uh, when he was connected with services back in what, April, 2019, then just the reduction again, probably not a surprise to folks doing the work, but we were able to get some really good data to demonstrate the effectiveness of, uh, the different types of uh, ways that we engage patients. Um, so kind of going back to the pandemic and, and we wanted to do street medicine, uh, anyways, we are already doing this backpack outreach program that included medical providers and nurses. Uh, but with the mobile clinic, we could, you know, just kind of bring more stuff. Um, <laughs> and we could equip the mobile clinic with uh, laptops and get connected to our EHR and um, have a cooler uh, with vaccines that were was stable, um, you know, even a refrigerator, things like that. So uh, we built this street medicine committee. Uh, we started developing some street medicine protocols. Uh, we really actually stole the street medicine field manual from Alameda County because I liked it so much um, and, and used that and talked to other programs. Uh, we decided to partner with Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz to um, essentially, they hired sort of like a, a peer navigator and uh, we brought that person in to our system, uh, train them up in our electronic health record and the different map protocols that we use. And, um, and we work together to try and provide more low barrier medication assisted treatment uh, to folks 
specifically experiencing homelessness and and with the harm reduction coalition the target population was at their syringe services program so um this obviously you know brought up some interesting things for our program because we we had our own protocols and we knew that with harm reduction coalition there was going to be slightly different philosophies um they were going to be a little bit more flexible than us in terms of like, do we collect UVS? Do we not do that? We have a whole tier system. Uh, are they going to have a tier system? And uh, there, were, there were some disagreements. And, and you know, I just say, look, we got to have a whole menu of services for people uh, that want these different services. I mean, some people are going to want to have the more flexibility uh, plan and they can try that out. They should be able to try that out. Why should we not have that for them? And some other folks might want a more structured environment. So whether we require uh, support groups or UDSs or not, people are going to get those services as long as we offer this to them. So it ended up working really well um, and, and continues to work really well. Uh, we, you know, our whole foundation is, is harm reduction. Uh, I don't put this in here to educate you, but I put it in as a reminder because when we started this program and even, even today, there was still a lot of stigma in our community, especially even within our own health services agency. And we did a lot of work to try and change the culture, uh, to educate our, our colleagues within the health services agency, uh, about the benefits of this, these types of programs. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do. I asked for some emergency medical services statistics, uh, kind of spanning over the last three years, and you can see gradual increase. And this is just the number of ambulance runs related to overdose. Um, and these are through May of 2022, if you're looking at the 2022 number. So we are expected to go over that. And with the overdose data, um, we're still trying to collect some of that data, but it, it appears like we're going to be higher than 2021. Um, it, like almost all, every single county, uh, our, our health um, officer put out a Sentinel Health Advisory, um, uh, and we, of course, distribute Narcan. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm waiting on two pallets right now uh, of Narcan through Department of Healthcare Services. Uh, so our street medicine team, you know, again, small clinic, need to get people out because uh, we, we really just don't have enough workstations. We need a bigger clinic is what we need. Um, so uh, street medicine teams actually helped us in that way because uh, we got to reach people that wouldn't normally come to the clinic. Um, again, people experiencing homelessness, not unlike the general population, may have had a lot of traumatic experiences working with the healthcare system. So uh, we recognize that, we acknowledge that, we wanna meet people where they're at. And really it's about building relationships. So if we can do that, um, then you know we're one step closer to uh, getting people back into uh, being interested in taking care of themselves and to getting checked up and not being afraid of getting a lab drawn. Um, these are conversations that we wanna have with uh, everyone out there. So smaller teams, they're a little bit more experienced. We can have inexperienced staff and volunteers even come through, but we always wanna make sure that we're connecting them with more experienced staff. Um, and that's a great way because there generally is a lot of interest in doing outreach and getting out of the clinic and street medicine in general. Um, since there's a lot of interest, usually uh, we can, try and train up some of the other providers and other staff that might be more clinical and, and in the brick and mortar clinics. So it's a good opportunity there. Uh, again, you know, no surprise here, but expanding access. Um, and we're, we're still sort of looking at the numbers, but uh, I'll just go to this slide. Um, you can see our numbers increasing. This is kind of like, these are just medical provider visits. So this doesn't capture any of the nurse visits, uh, nurse encounters or case manager encounters or anything like that. This is just uh, scheduled completed appointments uh, with a medical provider. We're small, we're trying to expand. Um, you can see in May and June right there, that's basically people taking vacation um, and, and you can see the impact that it has. So the goal, uh, kind of like what Chris said, is to have backups for backups 
right? And it had more people trained up and able to do this because when you're doing street medicine, when you're in anybody that's done outreach or street medicine knows this, depending on the type of service that you're off, offer, depending on, uh, all right, we're going to do a whole bunch of hepatitis C testing today. Well, you got to get the hepatitis C bin ready and maybe you got to get a different table for that. And where is all that stuff stored? Um, so it takes a lot of uh, organization, a lot of storage, um, you know, uh, being able to uh, hoard, but in a, in a way that's organized because people are going to need bottled waters, for example, you know, just bringing people bottled water and, and food, if you can, is, uh, is a lifesaver, socks, uh, you name it. And our staffing is providers, public health nurses, um, the mental health client specialists, uh, IBH is integrated behavioral health, Healing the Streets is a SAMHSA funded program through our behavioral health program to help uh, sort of bridge the silo that's usually between behavioral health programs and clinics. Uh, we work closely with public health and our community partners um, like Salud para la Gente, Community Action Board, Harm Reduction Coalition, and some of the homeless service providers. Uh, since we kind of rolled out the hepatitis C testing, we've been averaging about five patients getting tested and then connecting them to uh, confirmatory tests and treatment. And, and we want to do the same with HIV and sort of integrate all that within um, within our, our MAP program. Uh, so uh, I am going to wrap up. I want to keep it simple because I want to open it up to questions. Uh, and just a, a few things. Um, uh, last week was International Overdose Awareness Day. I hope people were able to participate in that. And, uh, and and really honor the people that we've been able to work with and, and uh, the people that we've lost. So uh, thank you. And, and let's open it up for questions, folks. And okay, work. it worked. Yay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so I um, am from a kind of a newer startup or a smaller rural mat clinic, FQHC. And um, and so you were trying to kind of grow our program. And uh, one thing that we we have a homeless camp in Placer County, which is in really close walking distance from our clinic. Um, and so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are as far as strategies, how we can reach out to them to, um, you know, kind of help in that community and get them in our clinic and the MAP program and things like that. Yeah. So like a more rural um area where people might, the encampments might be more spread out, I'm assuming. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So no, they, they actually were, they're really tightly, they actually fenced in an area for the homeless population. And um, I mean, we could throw a stone and hit them from our clinic and, and we just, we don't know how to reach out or what's the proper way or um, how to do that. Go about kind of, we have referrals from our, um, you know, when we have people that come out of jail, they'll call us, but the county that we work in, the public health, we've reached out to him, um, and they really contract with one specific map provider in the area, which is actually full, um, and apparently needs some paperwork. Anyway, so we're trying to strategize how to reach out to this, um, the homeless community, which is right next to us. Um, so if you try to, yeah, I would just ap approach them. Uh, you know, I, I think it doesn't hurt just to go up to folks and start talking to them and introducing yourselves. Of course, uh, there's always a question of, do you bring badges or not? What's going to be, uh, you know, we, our staff wear badges. Um, we've even talked about having some sort of identifier, like a, a common shirt or something, but people are pretty casual at Santa Cruz. Um, so they bring their badges, they introduce themselves and, and we kind of just go from there. And then we, if it's a pretty rural area or someplace that we haven't been to before, we try and announce ourselves ahead of time. Or if we know somebody who knows somebody camping there, we try and get an introduction. Uh, we're, you know, cautious about how we, um, work with like municipal agencies, like, um, uh, like the city of Santa Cruz or city of Watsonville, for example, we do work with them, but 
we have to be careful because if they're doing closures, we want to be transparent. We want them to be transparent with us and let us know when those are happening. So our staff are not going out on the same days as a, a potential closure. That's been a challenge over the years. Um, the last thing you want is to have, you know, potential patients, you know, putting you in that category as like, oh, they're, you know, uh, coordinating with the police or uh, somebody that's going to shut us down. Um, I don't know if that entirely answers your question. You know, there are different strategies uh, on who you're bringing out. You can do sort of like pop-up clinics if there's a large enough encampment where it's sort of centralized and then maybe you have uh, uh, maybe even up to 10 staff if you can. So you have a few people sitting at a location, maybe it's a mobile clinic or a table, and then you have other people branching out and going tent to tent. Uh, or you could have little teamlets where you just kind of break people up into groups of two if there's multiple encampments in an area that you want to hit up and you just kind of have those people uh, go out to the different encampments. They can communicate through a common source and ideally we would want to connect them with a medical provider. So having a medical provider on hand, either out in the field or at least available via telemedicine works really well in those types of situations. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, good question. I don't know if I, I answered it. Okay. But... Yeah. Thank you, Joey. So are there any questions in the room on site here, um, for either Chris or Joey? Yes. David. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, or the comment was that mobile clinics are a really good idea. Yeah. And, and so, and uh, specifically, uh, David was asking about in, in like South Los Angeles or even other urban areas. And indeed, these are now actually um, allowable expenses. Um, so mobile clinics are, um, depending on how you outfit it, um, it can run about $65,000, $70,000 to just get the van up and running. Um, sometimes you can actually, this is one of the things I will just throw it out there as somebody that runs a lot of grants and whatever. This is a great thing for public private partnerships because there are a lot of um, small foundations and other ones that, I mean, it's because there's a lot of bang for your buck, you can really see outcomes pretty fast and you can get into places where you can begin to establish relationships. I think I, I should let anybody else come in on this, but I think that, um, making connections with a brick and mortar also can be really helpful. And I think Joey also commented that the backpack phenomenon of, you know, doing street medicine with just a backpack can be the beginning to see where you need to go or just even doing your, um, you know, sort of um, asset mapping in your community and partnerships to know where you've got, you know, where you've got need and where you've got some resources to make things happen can be really a good thing for, you know, do you work with any mobile clinics in your area or not, Chris? No. Maybe not. No. Yeah. yeah you guys are a small, programs. you're, yeah. We have some programs that come to us, like your local hospitals might have mobile, um, like wound clinic mobiles, uh, or like they might have, um, UCSF, UCSF has a, a uh, a deliver van, which basically does um, on-site Hep C testing. Um, so local hospitals might have mobile services that you can engage and have come to your location. Right, and that can be a real service if you don't provide it. Then you partnerships. I mean, you heard um, Marlise this morning talk about sustainability. There will be source three funding, but that was not guaranteed. None of us knew if that was going to happen or not. You know, so. Um, you know, we really need to think about building those partnerships with other folks so that we can connect and fill in the gaps so that we can continue to do this. These ARPA and CRISA dollars and SOAR 3 funds are not going to continue for, you know, who knows what will happen, right? I mean, there's a lot of changes that are potentially afoot in administrations and support, maybe not in California, but nationally. So, um, you know, we couldn't even say harm reduction a few years ago. So things have flipped, you know, a lot. And um, we just need to be prepared to be, um, you know, to ready to go and just build as many partnerships as we can to really support our programming.